And welcome to this uh, series on four cities in the Middle East. Uh, so we'll be starting with Jerusalem tonight. Next week it will be in uh, Damascus, which is the capital of Syria. Then Baghdad, which is the capital of Iraq. And then we'll finish up with uh, Istanbul, which is the capital of Turkey. Some people say Turkey isn't in the Middle East, it's the gateway. Well, it's got enough Middle East culture and some very good hummus. So that, would, that, that qualifies it. Um, so what we'll be doing is uh, in each class, I'll be giving sort of a little bit of a historical background, some of the highlights of the history. Then we're going to take you on a tour of the various religious sites of each city. Um, just might ask, anyone been to Jerusalem here? One person? Okay, well this might be a bit of a review of some of the places you've seen. And for those who haven't, this will sort of be a virtual tour. Uh, I don't know how many, how we're going to, people are going to think about going to Jerusalem in the next <laughs> period of time. But uh, you never know down the line. So with that, we'll, we'll get started. So Jerusalem is a city in Western Asia situated uh, on a plateau in the Judean mountains uh, between the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. It's one of the oldest cities in the world, uh, considered holy for the three major Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The part of Jerusalem called the City of David showed first signs of settlement as far back as the fourth millennium BCE in the shape of encampments of nomadic shepherds. During the Canaanite period, which was 14th century BCE, it was referred to as Jerusalem on ancient Egyptian tablets, which probably referred to Shalim, who was a Canaanite deity. So according to the Hebrew Bible, the city was conquered by the Israelite king David who established as the capital of the United Kingdom of Israel. His successor, son and successor Solomon, commissioned the uh, building of the first temple. This is a model of what they believe it looked like. As, as, as you know, it will be destroyed. So by the 8th century BCE, Jerusalem had developed into the religious and administrative kingdom of Judah because the kingdom of Israel that was united split in 930. David had united it. There was a civil war. So in the north you had the kingdom of Israel and in the south you had the kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem was in the kingdom of Judah. Throughout its long history Jerusalem has been besieged 23 times, captured and recaptured 44 times, and attacked 52 times. In 586 BCE, it was conquered by the Babylonians, marking the beginning of what is known as the Babylonian captivity, when leading Jews were taken from Judah to Babylon and the first temple destroyed. When the Babylonian Empire was then conquered, by the Persians, Cyrus the Great, the Jews were allowed to return to their homeland and build a second temple. Interestingly, Cyrus is referred to in Jewish literature as a messiah. As a messiah. There have been many messiahs. So he was referred to as a messiah. You can see why he returned the people to their homeland where the temple could be rebuilt. However, with Alexander the Great's conquest of the Persian Empire, Jerusalem came under the influence of Hellenistic culture, Greek culture. Then in 198 BC, the city came under the control of the Seleucids. Who were the Seleucids? They were one of Alexander's successor kingdoms. When Alexander died, his empire was divided into three. And the Seleucids were one of those the Ptolemies were the other in Egypt, and then there was a Macedonian side. So uh, they came under Greek influence. You'll notice throughout this brief history, Jerusalem is continually coming under foreign domination. Continually, one way or another. Uh, 
Then in 167, there was a revolt. There was a revolt of Jew uh, Jewish leaders uh, known as the Maccabean Revolt. And uh, the Greeks were thrown out for a period of time. And they established the Hasmonean Dynasty, which lasted until 37 BCE. What? Who comes in in 37 BCE? The Romans. The Romans. And they uh, set up Herod the Great, who was Jewish, but they set him up as the king of Judea, but he was really a puppet in many ways of the Roman Empire. That's how the Romans operated. You had your, generally you had your emperor back in Rome, then you had your various uh, uh, administrators out, and then you get local people to run the situation as long as they paid their taxes and didn't do anything that was going to upset Roman rule. So Herod was very much on the, uh, on the side of the Romans, as it were. And if you know anything about the, the gospel stories of the Passion, Herod doesn't come across too well. You know, he's, uh, so. Then in uh, 66 CE, the population rebelled against the Roman Empire in what is known as the First Jewish-Roman War. Major turning point in the history of Judaism and as it will turn out, Christianity. Roman legions under the future Emperor Titus conquered and destroyed much of Jerusalem in 70 CE. I'm not much one for dates, but that's one date, 70 CE. That's the destruction of the second temple. That's the destruction of the second temple. Um, it was burnt, and all that remained were some of the external walls, which we'll visit today. Um, in the fourth century CE, the Emperor Constantine rebuilt Jerusalem as a Christian center of worship. Constantine was the Roman Emperor who accepted Christianity as the official religion of the empire. Changed the history of Christianity forever. That's another topic. Um, his mother, Helena, now Saint Helena, made a pilgrimage to the city and claimed to have found Jesus' cross pieces of which she took back to Constantinople, which is the beginning of the, the famous relics. That you, if you go to uh, cathedrals uh, throughout Europe, most of those major cathedrals will contain a relic, either a cross, a nail, a cloak, or something like that, which are generally shown maybe once a year. Once a year. So she, brought, she was very important. But as time goes on, the city was conquered by the Arab Caliphate in 683, 638. So that's, I'm thinking a pretty big jump here. But Islam comes into being in the uh, 7th century and spreads rapidly and spreads right across. As you can see, that's the Umayyad Caliphate. It spread very quickly all the way up into Spain. And in the process, uh, took over what is now Israel and, and the city of Jerusalem. Uh, it was then later, there were other di uh, Arab dynasties that took control as well. But it became known uh, by Muslim geog geographers as the most fertile province of Palestine. Okay, so the province is, is called Palestine. The Jew, Jewish people always called it Israel. And there's still this conflict up until today. Under the Romans, it was known as the, uh, uh, Romans and the Muslims, it was known as the province of Palestine. So after a couple centuries of uh, Muslim rule, we have the first crusade. July 1099, Jerusalem is captured, and it's pretty horrific what went on there. And we have actual historical accounts of the slaughter by Christian crusaders of both Muslims and Jews. Pretty horrific. This uh, Unfortunately, this tribalism that can often get incorporated into religious warfare. Um, but the kingdom was recaptured by the Muslim Saladin and settled down for a relative period of peace. Then, you get, you're taking all this down? <laughs> you don't have to remember all the details. Do you get the picture? Yeah. That's the general thing. You get the picture. The Ottoman Empire, the Turks, the Turks come in and control Jerusalem in 1516 under Suleiman the Magnificent, one of the most famous. You like that headgear? 
Yeah, I love that. Maybe we can market that, get it going again. You know, fashions do come back. He's one of the f most famous Ottoman uh, emperors, actually world emperors. He was a very cultured man, did a lot of building, including rebuilding much of Jerusalem. Uh, but the Ottomans eventually fall. When do the Ottomans fall? At the end of World War I. And we have what is called the British Mandate in Palestine. When the Ottomans fell, the British and the French divided the Middle East up basically between them. And the, and the British got Iraq and Palestine, and the French got Lebanon and much of uh, Syria, and it was called the sykes pico Agreement. Uh, it was secretly done <laughs> and, and then sort of announced to the Arabs. Has anyone seen the movie uh, Lawrence of Arabia? Remember when the, the Arabs come in to Damascus, they're, they, they've been told by people like um, Lawrence that they're going to get the, this territory and it'll be under their control. They fought with the, the Allies to defeat the Turks. Uh -uh. The British controlled it. It was known as the British Mandate. Uh, and this marked a, a period of uh, great internal unrest for a couple of reasons. First, the imperialist British being there. And second, in 1918, there was something called the Balfour Agreement, which the British government signed to give the Jews a homeland in Israel, not a state, a homeland. I think the British ideal was there'd be a Jewish homeland, there'd be the Palestinians, they'd be able to work it out, there'd be one state. Yeah, so, uh, and the British, they, they uh, that was, so during that time, there was a lot of immigration from Europe, especially Eastern Europe, into Israel under what was known as the Zionist movement. Okay. The Jews wanted a homeland, and this took place. But this caused a great deal of friction with the uh, Palestinians who were living there. There were riots in Jerusalem in 1920, 1929, <coughs> throughout the 30s. So what's going on today is nothing new. There's been a lot of tension in, uh, in this part of the world between Palestinians and, uh, and Jews for, for quite a while, with, with numerous deaths. Uh, the Jewish population, to defend themselves, uh, created what they called defense forces. And some of them were rather, what they might be considered terrorist. But the Palestinians were doing the same. I'm not saying this. But, a good example, in 19, July of 1946, the King David Hotel was uh, blown up by a, a radical uh, Jewish group called the Irgun. Uh, 91 civilians were killed. It was the British headquarters. It was the British headquarters in, in Jerusalem. So after World War II, as in India, the British decide to say adios. We're getting out of here. And fairly quickly, they turn it over to the UN. What to do with this situation in Palestine, Israel, and it's handed over to the UN. Not long there, and the UN rec not recognizes the state of Israel under David Ben-Gurion as the first prime minister. Following the war, Jerusalem was, uh, there was, oh, sorry, there was then, yeah, this is big. So the state is, you know, how do the Arab nations react? They invade. Egypt, Jordan, because they feel that, no, this isn't right. You know, this is Arab land. And so they invade, and they get their butts kicked. You know, the Israeli army just takes them apart. It was a, a, a very big defeat, which has remained very strong throughout uh, the uh, Muslim countries in the Middle East. However, what's interesting in relationship today, down in southern Israel, that was taken by the Jews during the war, and the Palestinian population was exiled to Gaza. That's why it's a very big contention right now. A lot of those Palestinians in Gaza still have keys to houses in southern uh, Israel. So that's, 
another reason this has been a very big and continuing issue. Uh, so following, uh, following the war, Jerusalem was divided. The western half of the new city became part of Israel, while the east, which would include the old city, which we'll be in, was occupied by Jordan. So after four, Jordan took control of, of the eastern city. Uh, in January of 1950, the Israeli parliament, however, passed a resolution that stated Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. That could be problematic. You've just claimed your capital in part of the city that is your, uh, not under your control. Uh, East Jerusalem was then captured by the Re Israeli defense forces during the next war, the Six Day War, 1967. And that, again, fairly short war. Israelis win quite handily. Uh, so today, Jerusalem is divided into the new and old cities, both under the control of Israel. You can see the, the comparison in size. If you look at the old city, is, is a little circle up top. Um, and it was further divided into quarters. So if you ever go to Jerusalem, there are four quarters. It's a picture of the old city and the walls. There's the map, and here are the four quarters. There's the Muslim quarter, there's the Jewish quarter, there's the Christian quarter, and there's the Armenian quarter. And the Armenians are Christians, but they're Eastern Orthodox. So those are the four quarters. And those quarters are marked off pretty well. You can tell which quarter you're in. Um, and when we were there, all four quarters were constantly controlled by fairly young people, 1920, all carrying AK-47s to ensure no problem. Okay, so uh, let's now turn to a bit of our tour. Any questions about the history? Good. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Continual conquest, continual uh, warfare. Uh, so, all right. Uh -huh. it's just, it's, it's, because it was conquered so many times back and forth, is that just a geographical location? It's not, I mean, trade. 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 From yeah. ancient times, trade came right up that, from India all the way up through there into the Mediterranean. Yeah, very, and, for, and was very fertile in, in, in many areas, especially the north, the north, if you've ever been to uh, heaven in the north. Okay. So let's uh, start at perhaps what's known as the most famous, the, the Temple Mount, the holiest site in Judaism. So I'm going to go over the Jewish uh, sacred sites first. Uh, it's the place where God's presence is maintained more than any other place if you're a Jew. This is because what was on the Temple Mount? The Temple. <laughs> It's like who's, born, who's buried in Grant's tomb? <laughs> On the Temple Mount was the, both temples, the first temple of Solomon and the sem second temple that was, had been built by Herod. Uh, and uh, so today the Temple Mount is occupied by Muslim sacred sites, which we'll see, the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, when we were there in 2011, uh, you, you had to, if you were coming from the old city, you had to go up a special ramp where guards were there with guns to make sure that there was no problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, since this, since this, uh, the Temple Mount is a sacred site now for Muslims, you don't find Jews going up there. What you will find, you'll find them at the Western Wall. That's the old, one of the old walls of the, of the city. When the, when the Romans destroyed things, they destroyed things. They, they leveled Jerusalem. They leveled the Temple Mount. All that remained were some of the walls. And that took a lot of doing, because those buildings were, were, pretty, were pretty strong. So today, uh, you, we find the Western Wall. It's one of the most sacred spots in contemporary Judaism. Relatively small segment of the 488 meter long retaining wall 
that abuts the side of the western, uh, western wall of the mount. That's because, as we'll see, most of that is underground. This is the part that's above ground. Uh, at one time, it was known as the Wailing Wall, uh, which uh, Jews do not like that term, by the way. That, that was a term that was used by, by uh, uh, Gentiles. Uh, and uh, this is where people have come every, from all over the world to say prayers. And you can put a little uh, white piece of paper with a prayer in that wall. Oh, so did I? Yeah, there you get a better idea. Coming apart in more places than one. <laughs> Could someone do me a favor and just clip this on here? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, this is a place for prayer and pilgrimage. And there's a men's wall and a women's wall. And the women's wall is on the far right side. When we were there, and I know my wife, Chris, Chris just sort of goes out and does stuff. <laughs> she, we, were, we were going up the wall, and she was coming with Steve and myself up the wall. Suddenly, this one of these fellows <laughs> jumped out and said, oh, can't <laughs> go. Can't go. So there's always that separation. Um, This is, these, the, this is the Western Wall Tunnel. That's part of the wall that's now underground. And you can go and we, you can take a little tour through there. That's most of the 488 meters. Um, so that's, that's the Temple Mount. Uh, another site significant for Jews is the Tower of David Museum. It's located just inside what is known as the Jaffa Gate. There are four main gates. There's the, we'll see the Lion's Gate. There's the Jaffa Gate. Um, and the museum includes a courtyard which contains archaeological remains dating back 2,700 years. So if you're interested in archaeology and the remains, of, it sort of tells the history of Jerusalem right back to its nomadic times. Um, uh, there's 400,000 years of, of, of Jewish history there. The, temple was dubbed the Tower of David by Byzantine Christians. Probably wasn't the Tower of David, but they named it the Tower of David. Uh, a name that comes from the Song of Songs attributed to Solomon, uh, David's son, who wrote, Thy neck is like the Tower of David, built with turrets, whereon there hang a thousand shields, all the armor of the mighty men. There are also smaller synagogues. There's, remember, now, there's, there are no temples in Judaism today. There are synagogues. There were only two temples. Those are in Jerusalem. That's where animal sacrifice took place. That's where the high priesthood was. That's where the Day of Atonement took place. Once the Jews were driven out during the diaspora and went all over the world, there they have places of worship, but they're called synagogues. You might get a little confused because some of them would be called temple so-and-so. Not, that's not the Jewish temple. There is no Jewish temple right now. Although Messianic Jews believe it will be rebuilt when the Messiah returns. That's still part of Messianic Judaism. In any case, uh, there are some very famous uh, synagogues in the city. Uh, this is known as the Hurva. Synagogue, located in the what quarter do you think it's in in the old city? It's in the Jewish quarter. Yes, yes. founded in the early 18th century on the ruins of an earlier 15th century uh, mosque that had been destroyed by the Ottomans. Generally, when these conquering powers come in, they often destroy holy sites. It's sort of like putting your you, know, you stamp on a place. It happens all religions have done it to each other. Um, so in any case, uh, the plot lay desolate for about 140 years and became known as the Ruin, R-U-I-N. And that's what Hurva means. Hurva means ruin. Uh, in 1864, it was rebuilt 
and uh, became Jerusalem's main Ashkenazi synagogue. Now, Jews around the world are divided basically into two groups, Ashkenazi and Sephardic. The Ashkenazi initially were in Middle Europe, were, during the pogroms were pushed into Eastern Europe. So Ashkenazi we re relate to by people like Poland, Russia, Lithuania, Sephardic, Spain, Portugal. And they were driven out by Isabella and Ferdinand, 1492. We tend to think of 1492 as Columbus. Well, 1492 was the expulsion of, uh, of Jews and Muslims from Spain to purify it. So in any case, uh, it was uh, as when the Ashkenazi came, they sort of took over this synagogue. Uh, it was destroyed again in the 48 war. Uh, after Israel captured East Jerusalem in 67, uh, a new synagogue was envisioned and finally approved by the government in 2000 and dedicated in 2010. So that's the, the whole of the synagogue. Let's just step inside for a moment. At the far, far wall, and you'll find this in any synagogue, is the, uh, is the Ark. That's where it'll be the Ark of the Covenant goes inside that, uh, that uh, covering. And it's kept there until, and during worship, it's brought out. And this is known as the Bima. It's where uh, people reading, reading passages or if maybe a, a sermon is given from this standing point. So that's, that's the inside. When we were there, they were, they were having a wedding. And we, we were just standing outside and all of a sudden all this noise and the, the, uh, the big horn was being blown and it was, it was quite, a, quite a deal. Okay. Um, there are also what are known as the four Sephardic synagogues. These are the synagogues where the Spanish uh, uh, exiles came and, and established their places of worship. Um, there are four adjoining, uh, adjoining synagogues uh, built in different periods to ac accommodate the religious needs of this community. Uh, later, the courtyard was converted and became known as the Middle Synagogue. So you sort of get a little bit from the map there and just some of the interior. Did they worship the same in each of those? A li little different. The liturgy is a little bit different, even in the four Sephardic. You know, each community has its own, its own, its own emphasis. Yeah. Okay, there are two other places that are found in the new city that are well worth uh, visiting. This is um, this is the Israel Museum, founded in 1965. Yeah. It has a lot of building. Can you see the urn? You see the building here on the right. It looks like a flying saucer. Can you see it in the in the left picture? In the left, it's in the back. So this is only one building in part of a much larger museum. The reason I've shown this is this is where you find the shrine of the book, which houses the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were uh, discovered uh, in the, near Masada. Uh, in the 1940s. Um, Reverend Elbert and I are going to be giving a class on both the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Gnostic Gospels uh, after this series. So these are the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some of the oldest biblical manuscripts in the world. And really revol revolutionized the study of, uh, study of uh, early biblical studies. Because these are the earliest manuscripts and they came from a community known as the Essens, or the, some people say the Essenes, Essens, who lived in a small community called Qumran, outside of Ju uh, Jerusalem. They were sort of puritanical. They, they, they moved out because they thought mainstream Orthodox Judaism uh, was not pure enough. They were also very apocalyptic. You know what apocalyptic means? They felt the end times were very near. Some people believe that John the Baptist may have been a member of this group. Some have suggested that Jesus may have rubbed shoulders. But in any case, they, uh, this, this famous shrine of the book houses the permanent display of life in Qumran. Then there's the Ayad Vashem, which is Israel's official memorial to the victims of the Holocaust. 
The name Yad Vashem means a memorial and a name. It's taken from a verse in the book of Isaiah. Even unto them will I give in my house and in, within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Now this is in the new city. Okay? These, the, the museum and the memorial are not in the old city. They're in the new city outside the walls. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a long, uh, well, there's a rampway and then there's a, a, a large gallery. As you walk down, it's all the displays uh, that, uh, recording the history of, um, of, of the Holocaust. It was opened to the public in 1957, exhibits fo focusing on Jewish resistance initially in the Warsaw Ghetto, if you know anything about the history of, of Jewish resistance. Uh, and uprisings at the Treblinka death camp. The first uh, uprising took place at, at Treblinka. Uh, a new building was dedicated in 2005. Consists of a long corridor connecting 10 exhibition halls, each dedicated to a different chapter of the Holocaust. If you, well, I don't know how many people are gonna be going to Jerusalem, but if you do go and you visit this, afterwards you're gonna wanna go home and lie down lie down. It's very emotional, very draining to, to see, uh, see the, uh, all the images and the photographs. And there's the Hall of Names, a uh, memorial to the six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust. Now there aren't six million pictures, but they're continually collecting pictures of people who believe they had relatives, etc., in the Holocaust. Does anyone here know Selena? Selena Benyez, Benyez, who's she spoke here at one time. Yeah, yeah. She lives. She lives in. in case. She was. Uh, she was in Schindler's Factory yes. as a young girl. As a young girl, uh, she was at Auschwitz for three weeks. Her her mother. Uh, has anyone seen the movie Schindler's List? If, if you may remember that. The, the women that he had hired were supposed to come to his factory, but they were taken mistakenly initially to Auschwitz, and he had to go rescue them. Well, while they were there, Selena was there with her mother, and she tells the story of how one day she was in, the, uh, in, in one of the barracks. Her mother had gone out to do a work detail, and Mengla, Dr. Mengla, came in. And when he came in, that usually meant this barracks is going to the gas chamber. Uh, and he said, get your stuff together. We're going to go have a shower. And uh, she walked up to him and said, I'm not going without my mother. And he looked at her for a long period of time. She, this is what she told me. And she said she looked in his eyes and it was like transparent, like he had no soul. And he looked at her and he eventually said, OK. You can stay. He wasn't doing it out of compassion. It was just that he had the power to say yes or no. His mother came back, Schindler came, they went to the factory, and Selena now lives out at University Village. I think she's spending, her husband Vinny died a couple of years back. Wonderful woman. Wrote a book, it's, you can get it at Amazon if you're interested in learning about her life. Okay, let's, let's go to the Christian sites. Um, one of the most famous uh, spots is found just outside the Eastern Wall. It's known as the Mount of Olives. It's named for the olive groves that once covered the slopes. This is said to be an olive tree that's close to 1,000 years old. I guess olive trees can exist a, 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 for a, a long period of time. I'm not an expert on trees, let alone olive trees, so I, I, I can't verify that, but we were told that it's close to a thousand years old. Uh, the site has also been used as a Jewish cemetery for over 3,000 years, which holds approximately 150,000 graves. So if you're standing on the Mount of Olives looking back towards the city, just on, down from the eastern wall, you, this is where the cemetery is. Uh, Several key events in the life of Jesus, as related in the Gospels, took place on 
uh, the Mount of Olives, making it a site of Christian worship since ancient times. And today, a, a major site of pilgrimage for Catholics, Ether, Ether Orthodox, Protestants. Jerusalem, certain times of the year, you don't want to be there. You don't want to be there during Easter. And now, I mean, it's, it's just so crowded. Because people from all over the world come there during Easter. Here is located the Garden of Gethsemane, where, according to the four Gospels, Jesus underwent the agony in the garden and was arrested before his crucifixion. The garden became a focal site for early Christian pilgrims. In 1681, Croatian knights of the Holy Order of Jerusalem bought the garden and donated it to the Franciscan community, who owns it to this day. So the Franciscans own the Garden of Gethsemane. Close to Gethsemane is the Church of the Sepulchre of St. Mary, Mother Mary, believed by Eastern Orthodox to be the burial place of Mary, the mother of Jesus. The sacred tradition of Eastern Christianity teaches the Virgin Mary died a natural death, that her soul was received by Christ upon her death, and that her body was resurrected on the, which day? Third day, yes. After a repose, at which time she was taken up bodily into heaven. So another ascension. Her tomb, according to this teaching, was found empty on the third day. Tradition recounts that on the third day after her burial, her tomb was discovered empty, only the shroud remaining. The shroud was preserved in the Church of Gethsemane until 452 CE, <coughs> but it was sent to Constantinople to be kept in the Church of Our Lady of Belcrene, which you can see if you go to Istanbul today. So let's just take a little visit here. This is really, when you, when you go into this, you really feel a sense of, the, of awe of the sacred. You go down these steps into this cavern-like, cave-like. It's Eastern Orthodox, so you're going to find all sorts of icons. Icons are pictures of the saints, uh, that are used in worship. Yeah. There's the entrance to the tomb. And there's the stone bench where Mary was put to rest. So uh, up the hill from Gethsemane is the Church of Mary Magdalene. Can anyone tell what branch of Christianity that is? Russian Orthodox. The, the, the onion domes are very, yeah, it could have been Eastern, but this is, this is Russian Orthodox. <clears throat> According to the 17th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, Mary Magdalene was the first to see Christ after his resurrection. Yeah, a woman. The church was built in 1888 by Tsar Alexander III and his brothers to honor their mother, Empress Maria Alexandrova. So this was built to honor both Mary Magdalene and the em uh, Empress of Russia. <clears throat> it was construct constructed in the traditional uh, style popular in 17th century Russia, seven distinctive gilded onion domes, which you can... The relics of two martyred saints, Grand Duchess Elizabeth Fyodrovona and her fellow nun, Varvara Yakolova, are displayed at the church. Both were imprisoned during the Bolshevik Revolution and martyred in 1918. 
So adjacent to uh, this church is the Church of All Nations, also known as the Basilica of the Agony. So the church's construction was founded by 12 different nations. Therefore, the Church of Nations. Um, is, it's said to mark the place where Jesus prayed on the night of his arrest. A large rock near the altar is said to be where he actually prayed. Whether it's factual or not really doesn't matter. What's more important for religion is what people believe. And you can argue whether this is the exact spot or not. But it's believed to be the spot, and it therefore becomes a, a pilgrimage site. There are other churches on the Mount of Olives. The Dominus Flevit is in the shape of a teardrop. Can you see that? In memory of the moment when Christ wept as he foresaw the destruction of Jerusalem. I worked for a guy at a research center in San Francisco at one point, and he liked to ask his uh, work, find, get, it, get some text, something, and boil it down for me. I want to know, you know, what's the essence of this thing? So I'll give you an example. You can summarize the entire Gospels in two words. Jesus wept. So this is, this is it's a very famous passage. Uh, he's weeping because he sees what will happen to Jerusalem. Then there's the, the church of Peter Noster. What does Peter Noster mean? Our Father. You know why it's called the church of Peter Noster? This is the spot where Jesus taught his disciples to say the Our Father. Final Christian uh, space on the Mount of Olives is uh, two miles away. It's called the village of Bethany. It's still on the mount, but it's two miles away. Uh, this is where it is believed Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection and then ascended into heaven. He didn't meet them in Jerusalem. He met them in the village of Bethany. In 390, a wealthy Roman woman financed construction of a church there called the Eliona Basilica, or the Basilica of the Olive Tree, it was destroyed by the Persians in 614. It was subsequently rebuilt by the Crusaders and then destroyed again, leaving only this one building known as the Edicula. What's important about this? What do you think's inside of this? Can you tell what that is? It's supposed to be? Footprints. Whose footprints? Jesus. Jesus, before the ascension. I think I've mentioned in a number of classes on different religions the significance of the footprint. The Buddha's footprint, Muhammad's footprint, Vishnu's footprint. This is something common. This idea that foot is, footprint is sacred. Uh, anthropologists have tried to speculate as to why. Uh, one of the reasons, this is where the sacred and the profane connect. And this is where the sacred, whether you believe it's the Buddha or, and so in any case, so you can, you can visit that. Okay. So we're going to re-enter through the Lion's Gate. We're going back into the old city now from the Mount of Olives. And we come to the Via Dolorosa. The Via Dolorosa or the Way of Sorrows held to be the path that Jesus walked carrying his cross on the way to his crucifixion. It begins at the Antonia Fortress. I don't know, can you see that on the map up there? Does it say Antonia Fortress? Mm -hmm. okay. And ends at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which we'll visit shortly. It's about 2,000 feet, and it winds itself through part of the, uh, of the, of the old city and it's become a celebrated place of Christian pilgrimage. 
It's marked by what are known as the nine. Oh, I got to tell you about this place first. This is on the Via Della Rosa. This this is where we stayed. This is it used to be an old church. It were actually a monastery for nuns, and it, it's been turned into a. Um, uh, uh, place where people can come and stay. Very cheap. Rooms are very bare, but you don't spend a lot of money there. Uh, it's called Eke Homo. Does, any, does no, anyone know what Eke Homo means? Behold the man, which was in reference to Jesus and Pilate in their conversation. Eke Homo, behold the man. So there are nine stations of the cross. And these are nine places where events happen during Jesus' uh, march through the Villa Dolorosa. Uh, since the 15th century, there have been 14, because okay, five more were added at the church. Okay. But the, originally, there were just nine on that, and there are only nine on the Villa, Villa Della Rosa. But for example, those are the, the third station. If you, if you read the, the, the stories in the gospel, at one point Jesus falls and then is held back up. That's, this is marks that station. Then he, at a certain point he meets his mother Mary and this marks that station. So there are nine stations. And if you're there during you know, normal times, people are just walking around. It's business going on as usual, but there are those nine stations. You can always find them. Now that's what happens on Good Friday. <laughs> Why I suggest you, if you do go, eh, well, if you like crowds and you like, you like, you like the, uh, but it gets, it gets very crowded. And it ends at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's in the, which quarter is it in? Christian, good. Marks the end of the Via Della Rosa. Uh, Following the Roman siege of 70, like we said, Jerusalem had been pretty much reduced to ruins. So on 130 CE, the Roman Emperor Hadrian ordered that a cave containing a rock-cut tomb be filled up in order to create the foundation for a temple dedicated to the Roman god Jupiter. So there was initially a temple to Jupiter on this spot. After Constantine converted to Christianity and sent his mother, Helena, to Jerusalem, where among other things, she was searching for Jesus' tomb. With the help of a British uh, a bishop, not a British bishop, with the help of a bishop, three crosses were found near the temple of Jupiter. Leading her to believe they had found Calvary or Golgotha, the place where Jesus was believed to have been crucified. Constantine then ordered the temple of Jupiter to be replaced by a Christian church. After the temple was torn down, was removed from the cave, revealing a rock-cut tomb that Helen identified as Jesus' burial site. The church was consecrated September 13, 335 CE. Over the centuries, it's been destroyed several times, war, fire, each time rebuilt and renovated. According to tradition, the church contains Christianity's, oh sorry, I'm going, two most sacred sites which I think, I, I can't read that, but yeah, I hope that you can see them uh, uh, on the map. One, the site where Jesus was crucified, known as Calvary or Golgotha, and the second, Jesus' tomb, where he is said to have been buried and from which he was resurrected. They're on opposite ends of the church. As you come in, right in the first, you'll see this, the Chapel of Calvary. This is supposedly, at least it's believed to be, a spot of crucifixion. And that's supposedly the rock of Calvary.
The tomb is located on the other side of the church and is enclosed in a shrine, which we saw earlier is called the Idicula. We saw that up at Bethany. Again, it's shared by three different uh, Franciscans, Eastern Orthodox, and I believe Syrian Orthodox. They share control of the church. And there have been instances in the past where they've been actually fighting with each other inside the church. <laughs> anyway, but pilgrims come again from everywhere. You go through a very sacred, holy space. Okay, one last uh, Christian site is known as the Upper Room. This is the place where, according to tradition, Jesus and his disciples celebrated the Last Supper. It's located on Mount Zion, just outside the old city walls. It's not actually within the walls. Interestingly, on the ground floor, one finds what is said to be King David's tomb. Although historians and archaeologists uh, consider this not to be the actual resting site of King David. But again, if you believe it is, and that's part of your... Uh, people come from all over to see it. Okay. Now we finish up with the Muslim holy sites. And the two most famous are on top of the Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock, which you can see there with the Golden Dome, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is down near the bottom of, the, of, the, of that picture. As previously mentioned, in 638, the Islamic Caliphate extended its dominion to include Jerusalem. And by the late 7th century, construction of a shrine on the Temple Mount, now known as the Dome of the Rock, was completed. Now this is a shrine and not a mosque. A mosque is an Islamic place of worship. A shrine is a building that is dedicated usually to some famous individual or in this case, to a rock. <laughs> the Dome of the Rock. The rock is important because... Yeah. What do you think? Well, I thought what? something about Muhammad stepping on it and being carried away. There's that, but there's also a spot where this is believed that Abraham was asked to sacrifice Isaac. I it's also believed by Jews to be the spot above which the first and second temple existed. So, very controversial sacred spot. It's one of the oldest works of Islamic architecture. has been called Jerusalem's most recognizable landmark. A. Uh, C. Cresswell that wrote a book called The Origin of the Plan of the Dome of the Rock. He contended that it was built using the measurements of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Interestingly. The diameter of the wooden dome is 66.27 feet and its height is 67 feet. It's mounted on an elevated drum consisting of a circle of 16 piers and columns. Surrounding this circle is an octangular little spot, arcade, of 24 piers and columns. I don't know if you can see two individuals under that. Yeah. One of them is myself <laughs> <laughs> and, and my good friend Steve Scholl. Um, 
from our, it was very interesting, from our hostel at Eke Homo, which was only a rock throws away from the Dome of the Rock, every morning at about four, you'd hear the call to prayer. And it would echo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's hard to, to sleep late. Was the top of the dome gold? It's gold, it's gold, what do you call it? Um, leaf? Yeah, gold leaf okay. cover. And yeah, and gold leaf, yeah. Um, uh, on the walls of the Dome of the Rock is an inscription. Can you see the inscription in Arabic there? Uh, and it includes the following from the Quran. So peace is upon me the day I was born and the day I die and the day I shall be raised alive. Such is Jesus, son of Mary. It is a statement of truth about which they doubt. It is not befitting to the majesty of Allah that he should beget a son. Glory be to him when he determines the matter. He only says it be and it is. Yet Jesus is very holy in the Islamic religion. He's considered a prophet at the level of Abraham, Theoretically Moses, but not quite in practice. So he, he's very highly revered. The time we were there, we were not allowed into the interior. Uh, periodically, these, uh, the Dome and Al-Aqsa Mosque are closed off to non-Muslims. Usually during times of some sort of civic strife. There had been some strife in the city a few months before. Not between tourists, but between Jews. Usually the military and the, uh, the Islamic uh, shopkeepers. And so they had decided to close, close it off. So only Muslims were, were allowed when I was there. Can you uh, pay to go into there? Can you pay? Mm -hmm. No. You can only go in if you're a Muslim. We could have gone in if we lied. They said, we're Muslim. Now, you might watch out. They might ask you a question. But Steve and I know enough about Islam to have been able to say, yeah. But I, I, you know, I didn't feel that was the right thing to do. You don't go into a sacred spot on a lie. Yeah, so, so generally you will, it, they will know whether you're a Muslim or not if they ask you a few questions. Uh, reminds me, I was a kid, there was this movie about the Russians invading the United States. This was back in the height of the McCarthy era, the atomic bomb, the 50s. And there's this American patrol that's out, and there's the Russians have learned perfect English. And the guys, in their, the American troops are supposed to take these guys on. And uh, they said, well, how will we know if they're Russian or American? We won't know, they're dressed in our uniforms. He said, watch this. So the Russians come up, he says, hey, what about the Chicago Cubs? The guy said, oh, baby bear. <laughs> <laughs> and he opens up on them. <laughs> so there are just little things, you know, languages that you can tell with her. In any case, we didn't, we didn't go in. Um, yes, and as you said, uh, this is the stone. This is the foundation stone looking down. It's believed this is the spot where above which the, temp, the Jewish temple was located and where I, uh, Isaac uh, was sacrificed by uh, uh, Abraham. It's also for Muslims, the spot, it's interesting that you knew that, Bev, for, where Muhammad is said to have taken off on his night journey. He flew from Mecca and actually from Medina to Jerusalem, then to the heavens, where he met with Jesus and Abraham and Moses. It's called the night journey. Do you notice anything about the face? There isn't one. There isn't one. You never see the face of Muhammad. If his figure is even shown, it will be veiled. You never show the face of the prophet Muhammad. Generally, you don't show the Prophet Muhammad in any case. That's why you might understand how years back with the French magazine that published the pictures of Muhammad in not only his face, but in a not very nice way, uh, it became a 
source of, of rioting. In any case, that's another reason it's the, sa the sacred spot. Now, do you see, it's up in the upper left, there looks like a hole there. It's called the pierced stone. It's on the southeast corner. It enters a cavern beneath the rock known as the Well of Souls. That hole leads down. You can get in another way, but that's, that looks down into it. Uh, it na it's, its name is derived from a medieval Islamic legend that this place is where the spirits of the dead can be heard awaiting judgment day. So picture yourself down there talking to your buddy. You know, judgment's about 48 hours away. <laughs> what are you going to be talking about? Probably not the Super Bowl. Okay. Uh, okay. So along the southern wall of the Temple Mount, which we saw, is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, this is the, the mosque that uh, you may have read uh, maybe a year or so ago. There was a big turmoil. The Israeli troops went inside and started shooting up because they believed there were terrorists inside. Not a good idea to go inside sacred spaces. And, but this, has been, this was known as the sec, uh, third most holy mosque in all of Islam. There's the major mosque in Mecca, the Grand Mosque, the mosques in Medina, and then the mosque in Jerusalem. Originally, early Muslims prayed towards Jerusalem. It was later changed to pray towards Mecca. But Jerusalem is a very sacred, sacred site. For the, uh, okay. Um, there's the interior. Oh, the, 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 work, the artwork in the great mosques of the world is just incredible. You're just in awe. Okay, there are a number of other mosques, and, and this will be the, uh, the last mosque we visit. It's called the Mosque of Omar. Um, it's located opposite the southern courtyard of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So it's sort of right across the street. According to later narratives, after the Muslim siege of Jerusalem back in 637, the patriarch Sophronius, Greek Orthodox, refused to surrender except to the caliph, Omar. So that would be like if someone said, we're not going to surrender until the president, if, let's say if the president of the United States actually comes here. That usually doesn't happen. But uh, so the caliph came, caliph Omar, he traveled to Jerusalem, accepted the surrender. He then visited the Church of the Holy Sepulchre uh, when Sophronius invited him to pray inside the church. He declined, so not as to set a precedent and thereby endanger the church's status as a Christian site. Yeah. Very opposite of what we think of today. Of, that was the exact opposite. He wanted to protect the notion that this was a Christian site. So he wasn't going to go in and pray. But he built a mosque right across the street. The Mosque of Omar. Uh, and he prayed inside. He eventually came back and prayed inside. Um, before leaving, there is another sacred spot to my stomach. <laughs> If you like hummus, if you like hummus, you cannot beat Abu Shukri. It's on the Via Della Rosa. It's small. You wouldn't notice it. It just looks like this little cafe, sidewalk cafe. But its hummus is out of this world. Uh, some people claim it's not only the best in Israel or the best in the Middle East, but the best in the world. And so when I buy my hummus at Trader Joe's these days, <laughs> and I think back of what that was, but, you know, you, you do what you have. Okay, that sort of ends our, our journey for tonight. Uh, next week we'll be visiting Damascus, which is the present-day capital of Syria.
Okay, thanks for coming and uh, see you next week.